I'm putting this slide up first because it's quite interesting that very recently and frequently I uh, get emails from colleges and uh, groups from different parts of the world. And there was a UN model of the Northern Ireland peace process a month ago in Arizona. And they had 800 high school students from Mexico and from the United States attending this UN model. Um, and these um, young students had to uh, act the role of the Austro Unionist Party, the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, the Progressive Unionist Party, the Alliance Party, etc. And it was the young woman, Kachita, who was acting the role of the Women's Coalition, who uh, was smart enough to track me down and began to ask me questions about what it was like. Um, and I, I told her, and then I said, Look, let me know how you got on in the UN model, how successful were your negotiations. She wrote back saying, um, our delegation, the Women's Coalition, were incredibly successful. We got a 50% quota, uh, we got a Bill of Rights, we got a Civic Forum, and we got lots of other things. Um, and she then said, of course, we were only modelling the Northern Ireland Peace Process. Um, and then she went on to say, add, and you can see the names here. Uh, there's John Hume, there's Ian Paisley, um, there's David Trimble, and then she added at the bottom, you will also be glad to know that the roles of John Hume and Ian Paisley and John Alderdice um, um, were all played by highly intelligent young women. Um, and that she ended it off saying that they are going to stay in touch because they found it a fascinating uh, process and that they, of course, as a result, many of them learned a great deal more about Northern Ireland than they knew before. Now, why do I say that? I say that because if there are students as far away as Arizona studying Northern Ireland and evaluating our peace process, how much of that has actually happened here? Have we gone back? And this is, I congratulate CAJ for uh, having this event today because it has been rare that we've had the opportunity to benchmark, evaluate and see how much progress has been put in place. And indeed, I say that also because of that other uh, the fact that 50% uh, of all post-conflict countries slide back into conflict within five years. Now ours has been a roller coaster. The assembly was suspended four times. Um, there has been spontaneous outbreaks of violence for both uh, Republic and Loyalist sides. Um, and, but it is argued that it has been uh, contained um, and that the peace process has continued and that the agreement is still in place. But what parts of the agreement uh, have been successful and what parts have still to be undertaken and implemented. The Colombians are also here this weekend. They're in, in core um, tonight, uh, be driving up to McGee, uh, where they're going to spend three days with people from Northern Ireland uh, talking about the process. Some of you may know that the Norwegians are engaged with the Colombians, uh, both the Santos government and FARC are in uh, negotiations in Cuba uh, for the first round. Um, and again, they faced the same issues as we faced. Who was giving legitimacy to who? Uh, who should be at the table? Um, every party to the problem should be a party to the solution. Uh, these were all choices we faced uh, when we first entered the negotiations. But obviously, that first slogan, no more war, no more violence, uh, was what drove the first ceasefires and drove people there to say, let's see what we can do in order uh, to reach an agreement. I always say that we probably um, challenge the consequences of the conflict rather than attack the causes. And often when you sit down in negotiations, it is the consequences. Because if you try to actually analyze and then sort out all the causes, you could be at the table for some considerable time. But that's also a problem for us because we probably didn't agree on the causes. And as a consequence, there's a clashing interpretation still today about what was agreed. But there was lots of activism, um, trade union activism, peace activism, human rights activism, political activism. These are just some examples of what the women's movement were involved in. But the question is, whose voice is heard at the conflict saying? Uh, it was two and sixpence to get into that meeting, by the way, in Lurgan, uh, which was on a Bill of Rights back then. I couldn't actually find the date. But I wondered if we charged people to come to public meetings today to discuss the Bill of Rights. Um, what kind of price would we be putting on it? But eventually, in '94, the Belfast Telegraph headlines said it all. 
it said it's over, and of course the end of um, violence isn't always the end of conflict. But it certainly was the time to build. Um, and so what did we build? Uh, the expectation was very high. Christian Bale has said that, uh, or no, this was the start of the agreement, which I still actually carry around with me because it is incredibly important to keep checking what in fact did the agreement say on these issues. And it opens with the words and kind of poetic license to the British officials at the negotiations just to remind us that if we didn't learn what was in Le Chapeau, in other words, in the preamble, then we couldn't very well fight for putting something into the main body of the agreement. I remember that in terms of the last nights when we tried to insert the clause on women, the right of women to uh, full and equal political participation, and the officials on the British side saying to us, but what relevance has that got to do with Northern Ireland? Um, Chiron, this is around political conflict and political identity and religious sectarianism. And we said, well, actually, it has a great deal to do with what happened in terms of women as well, as does any conflict. Um, and he said, well, you need to put it in the chapeau. And I thought, what the heck is he talking about? The hat. And then I realised what he was talking about was the justification for having it in. We actually convinced him by using an old saying of Cathy Corkins, and I was glad that Cathy had been such a brave woman all those years previously and then deceased, was alive that night in the room to remind us about the famous phrase that she used about the armed patriarchy. Um, and eventually we convinced them sufficiently. Barbara's smiling because Barbara remembers this. We eventually managed to get that clause. But, I mean, obviously um, it opened with these words about Fresh Start, dedicating ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance, mutual trust, but most importantly, the protection and vindication of human rights of all. These were really, you know, um, visionary words um, to what extent. Obviously, after every conflict, it's going to take years to build trust. When I'm now involved in conflicts in other places, I, they talk about this word trust, and I think it's too high an expectation on people who've been in an enormous conflict to suddenly realize trust. You don't arrive at trust, you build trust. Um, but you build it through the protection and the vindication of the human rights of all. And I often think there were different things that we had to look at. The issue of citizens' allegiances, uh, obviously how to resolve this issue of British and Irish identity, but there were other identities that needed to be addressed. Citizens' entitlement in relation to exercising power over our own affairs, um, rather than having decisions imposed and citizens' consent on how we should be governed in the future. Um, those are not easy things to resolve, entitlements, allegiances, um, and the issue of consent. But there are three challenges that I felt we had to face. One was getting the process right. Um, how inclusive was that process? Uh, was it open to civic society? Was it open to parties that had never been involved in the previous rounds of failed negotiations? Was it open to working class parties as well as long-standing or middle-class constitutional parties? Was it open to uh, those who had affiliations to armed groups? Um, and those are really important questions when you sit down to make a peace agreement. Um, so ensuring an inclusive process was incredibly contentious, um, so much so that when we were asked to sit alphabetically around the table, there was one party, uh, the DUP, who changed their name to the Ulster Democratic Unionist Party in order not to be seated alphabetically between the Alliance Party and the Northern Ireland Labour Party. Um, and uh, so it gives you some indication of what I thought was quite useful is to seat people alphabetically because as strangers they would have to then sit next to each other. But actually the amount of mistrust and distrust amongst the participants was such that some chose to sit on the complete opposite side I actually think it was a loss to uh, the process when we entered the first assembly um, and the two largest parties, Ulster Unionist and SDLP, decided that they should sit on either side of the speaker because they were the largest parties and not revert to the previous sit seating arrangements which were alphabetical. Um, and that, I think, was a huge hunger for people to get back to the status quo as quick as they could because so many of them had so, felt so uncomfortable about the arrangements uh, during the peace negotiations.
the other thing that was introduced was sufficiency of consensus, which I think was a really interesting way of arriving at decisions when nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. It was agreed that the larger parties would just not be allowed to make decisions between them, that they would also be dependent on the smaller parties for agreement, so it meant that the Ulster Unionists worked with the Loyalists, and that eventually became really important when they entered back into the negotiations in September 97, when Sinn Féin came in, that uh, you remember that famous photograph, that David Trimble did not walk alone, he walked with Gary McMichael and David Irvine on either side of him, which sent a very symbolic message that we are entering this process once again together. Um, and we lost that. Um, and I again point out later that it could have been saved had there been an agreement amongst the larger parties to have an electoral reform system that included the list system, which was the system that brought those two smaller loyalist parties in in the first place. So in some senses the process was um, an innovative one, a different one, but it wasn't sustained um, and could well have been, but there wasn't the appetite to do so. Um, I think there was a, a desire by the larger parties uh, for the smaller parties to disappear as quick as they possibly could. I remember senior leaders on both sides, nationalists and unionists, saying there are far too many small parties around this place. The sooner we get rid of them, the better. Um, substantive issues are extremely important. It's not just the process. The process is important in peace. But getting your comprehensive agenda, what's on that agenda, um, and getting that agreed. The first year of the negotiations, we ended up fighting over rules of procedure. And there was already a clash between nationalism and unionism. Unionism strongly believing in the detail of procedure and nationalism strongly believing that we should get on, on to the comprehensive substantive issues. And for a year that debate went on. Um, but eventually when you do decide that you are going to make an agreement, it was like a domino effect that happened really, really quickly in that last week leading up to April 10th, 98. And the final piece is the most difficult of all. If you have agreed these things, then enforce them, entrench them. If they were put into the agreement, they were put into the agreement for a reason. And don't abandon them. And make sure that there are champions to see them through. Um, and I'll talk about that very quickly. So that's the first point that I've just made, was that um, sadly both are gone. David's deceased and Gary has gone back into community politics and was only briefly on the radio last week for the first time in 15 years. Um, but I do want to pay tribute to both of them in terms of their leadership that they had to play, in particular David, and I've often said a sign of leaders in this country is when they challenge their own side. As we have seen, it's too often adversarial politics leads us to challenge the other side uh, to do things that we wouldn't even sometimes ask of our own side. Um, and I did watch David asking that at a huge personal cost to him, um, asking of, of his own side to take the steps and to move on. And eventually it did take the toll on his life. And I said at his funeral that every day that I used to give him a lift, I, he was concerned about a gun attack on his life. And eventually it was a heart attack that killed him, but it might as well have been a gun attack because of the pressure that he lived under expecting that to happen. Um, finding a new line, which was also really important. At that time, compromise was a dirty word. We used to say compromise is not a dirty word, it's a sign of strength and not weakness. In the end, we started using words like accommodation, because compromise means that somebody is giving something away and they often don't see what they're getting back. But to reach an accommodation was really important. The headline on the um, paper, uh, the editorial said, women must stay strong. This was a particular time when we were facing some skirmishes, um, and uh, one of the papers said we need to focus on solutions. There was a lot of posturing and very little progress, but eventually we reached the hand of history and it fell on top of us as Blessed Blair arrived, and um, <laughs> there emerged an agreement at Christine Bale whose human rights and equality commitments went well beyond addressing the nationalist unionist communal divisions <coughs> to address other exclusions. It's really, really important that people see themselves in that agreement um, and don't feel excluded um, in elitist forms of negotiations. By their very nature, these big formal negotiations can be very elitist. You can see that that room suddenly became filled. It was a highly secure room in castle buildings. 
Everybody gives off about castle buildings. Um, I don't. I think it was a place where we were forced on top of each other. So much so that Willie McRae often forgot that where the men's toilets were and ended up in ours. Um, but there was a little um, um, kind of room where you could get a drink or tea. Um, and it was pretty bad when people turned to whiskey at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Um, well, that was after four hours of listening to Bob McCartney on occasions. But there was a time when I felt that the very fact that we had to engage in such a small and closed environment um, meant that we had to find each other in the corridors, um, in the toilets and all the informal network places. And the smokers probably ended up getting the most information of all. Um, except that they then lifted the smoking ban and everybody was allowed to smoke inside. Uh, this room, mainly because I think she was man smoked a pipe um, and would have been highly tense if somebody had taken the pipe off. And as a consequence, all the other men who smoked pipes started doing so too, so you can imagine what that room was like at times. Um, but it was intense, it was stressful, there was a huge adrenaline pump in the last week, um, and suddenly all these guys appeared, and I'm sure Dermot's here as well, and we probably looked behind us to say, where did all these people come from? And of course, most of them had been members uh, of parties affiliated to paramilitary organisations who suddenly called in all their people to make sure that they were standing in the room when we finally agreed the agreement, um, because it was really important that they got out the message very quickly about what we had just done. Um, Ian Knox's cartoons are always fantastic, and he sums it up. I mean, here was the agreement, and this is exactly what it says. The agreement is about your future, so please read it carefully, it's your decision. And of course, Ian produces the opposite one, which is, it's disagreement. Um, it's disagreement is about your past. Please repeat it endlessly because it's your lot. And to me, that is the clashing interpretation of what happened, is that people went in there to make choices. They agreed on a way forward. And very quickly, they started to clash over the interpretation of the agreement. Um, even the children in the 11 plus that year were asked what is the opposite of agreement and because all they'd heard in television was the word anti-agreement they all put into their 11 plus disagreement no anti-agreement and they all got marked wrong because the opposite of agreement is disagreement but they had to go back perhaps we hoped and check it because our Northern Ireland kids had heard nothing else but anti-agreement and thought this was the opposite of agreement and today we are still struggling um, to, to um, find a way forward. We had to make choices. Choices were demanded of us. You could either adhere to the old certainties, the old positions, the old war and language of division, or a choice between that and new thinking, a new vision, and some kind of new political imagining. And despite the differences in Northern Ireland, we did reach that agreement, and the political change that followed was welcomed. However, opposition then threatened, and still threatens, the process. But overt opposition is not by itself a serious problem. What's more serious is the continual clashing interpretations of what's needed to create the kind of change that's required. And that's more serious because it's located amongst the agreement's supporters and not just the agreement's opponents. The threat posed by this problem is often averted by a form of modelling through, particularly by parties having to share power I think it was Mark McGuinness who recently said, and I heard um, Edwin Foote say it yesterday in relation to the Long Cash Maze site when he was asked about sharing with Sinn Féin, and he said, I'm sharing with Sinn Féin because I have to, not because I want to. And Mark McGuinness said, I'm sharing, he believed that the DUP were sharing power not because they wanted to, but because they had to. So instead of having an alternative and more convincing interpretation of what that agreement meant in relation to power sharing, um, we could have had one that was much better equipped to bring in the new practices that the new political order required as in making an agreement. Um, one of the first things I thought happened that could have not happened was people selling the pain instead of the gain. Um, there's been much discussion about the Anglo-Irish agreement and as a consequence of Margaret Thatcher's uh, death. Um, and the role she played in that, and how the unionist community were felt sold out, and um, that there was an element of treachery, and that they had not been involved in those negotiations, and then this was imposed on them in relation to the Republic of Ireland becoming involved in decisions in the future governance of Northern Ireland. 
And if that was so distasteful, I could not for the life of me figure out why then did the 1998 Belfast of Good Friday Agreement not be promoted as the alternative and that the 1985 agreement was now uh, displaced by this new agreement. For me, that would have been the first step forward in relation to promoting the new constitutional arrangements. Um, and there was too much focus instead on prisoner releases, which I think again um, ended up uh, being a conversation over pain rather than gain. And of course prisoners had to be released following an agreement. 400 prisoners were released two years after the agreement. So what does that tell you? It tells you there was a benchmark, there was a timetable, and everyone knew what that agreement involved. We were released on license, it wasn't an amnesty, we were released on license on condition that they didn't instigate or commit violence again, didn't support a specified organisation and didn't become a danger to the public. And all of that was set up and overseen by different review commissions. Um, and so um, this was a bishop in the Church of Ireland who used the words prisoner releases, no cheap grace, and I thought he was absolutely right that rather than to sell it as a huge pain, and indeed the uh, Community Foundation Northern Ireland's projects from prison to peace show the importance of ex-prisoners and the role they play in our community today on the interface, on de-romanticising violence, on engaging in community restorative justice. Um, so the, why is this row over the Long Kashmir site today such a divisive one? Of course there were uh, different causes, different consequences, different interpretations. Um, and I think part of how ex-prisoners are viewed um, has to be part of that conversation. The other piece that was sold as, uh, uh, by some, and actually Sinn Féin did not sign up to policing reform immediately, um, and some on the anti-green side saw the policing reforms as emasculation. Emasculation is quite an interesting word in terms of seeing it as some kind of feminization of a predominantly male organization, which in a sense uh, did not happen. The quotas were for uh, Catholic recruits uh, and not for gender. But it was the broad political support of community involvement that led to the implementation of those reforms. In the dimensions of peace, as been described by Brendan McAllister and others as four wide wheels on this wagon, and of course the difference here in Northern Ireland was that both GB and Republic were pu pulling the wagon together. Both governments had started engaging. The European Union had in 1.6 million billion in euros and were pulling the wagon through Peace 1, 2 and 3. And, and really importantly civic society projects were involved through Peace 1, 2 and less so as the peace programmes went forward and of course Clinton's administration. All of those were important in terms of outside players. But these are the pieces that also go to make up an agreement. The government's arrangements happened, the policing reforms happened, very expensive but happened, and these two on the, on the other waves of the wagon have been much slower and much less investment. So very quickly, I am just going to go through the rest of the slides really fast. Um, there are multiple opportunities for transformation from any agreement. And these are what they would look like. We didn't do them all, we did some. Um, the humane correction system, which talks about prison reform, um, should have been in the agreement and wasn't. We released prisoners, but we didn't pay sufficient attention to the reform of prisons. And those were the questions that civic society asked, and quite rightly asked, trade union movements, civic society, in all the sectors that made it up. How representative will the institution be in the future? What are the mechanisms for accountability? Human rights were meant to be at the centre, and indeed in policing it starts with those uh, words. Um, how will the culture be reorientated from one of high security to one of service to the people? Police force, police service, those words matter. Um, and who will oversee the changes? Oversight is crucial. Um, and this, of course, again, is some of the pieces that made up the agreement. But affirmative action, I find it really amusing that political parties took apoplexy, not all, some have apoplexy at the, war, at the idea of affirmative action. And yet, take a look at the power sharing executive. That is based on the principle of DeHond. And when I asked Brendan um, O'Leary, did he consider these principles to be based on affirmative action? He said, of course, they're affirmative action. 
Well, we wouldn't have a coalition, um, an executive power sharing coalition, um, if those principles of the hunt, which are about affirmative action based on political representation and political identity. So for me, if it's sauce for the goose, it should be sauce for the gander. And affirmative action should then not bring a huge heart attack uh, response each time it's mentioned in relation to implementing a peace process. Dealing with past abuses has been extremely difficult. There are many people in this room uh, who have done a tremendous amount of work trying uh, to put their life's energy into dealing with many of these issues, some more successful than others. Um, and, um, and indeed, the expectation, I think, of us who were a part of the agreement was huge. We must deliver on all of these, we must deliver on them now. They can't wait, they're urgent. Um, and of course, some people were told to wait whilst other bits got done. Um, and so the quick wins became um, the priorities. Um, and as I said, we should have combined prison reform with prison release to come back to it now, 15 years later, when in an economic recession is making it much more difficult to reorient that culture uh, to, from one that was of high security to one in the peace process is a tough thing to do. It was the security sector reforms that got prioritised and interestingly a thousand police officers who had received redundancy packages were rehired. So questions of course were asked about the amount of money that was spent in this particular sector um, but more importantly uh, how accountable were some of the actions that followed. Um, so again transitional justice mechanisms could have been more affordable um, but much, most of the money was put into the big formal security sector reforms and this is the bit that has particularly had to weigh it. Um, there was to be a new social contract. We did advise on it. You'll recognise some of the faces here in terms of that day when we launched it. Um, the messages had come from South Africa. This is the South African ambassador and Chris Sidoli from Australia. That these things should be enforced. That they can entrench the protections that are particular to the conflict by making these rights judicial. Um, at that time, we had a difficulty with the human rights so-called industry. I felt that this was not very productive or conducive to helping us um, embed a culture of rights, in that there was a belief that it only justified terrorist acts, um, and that they, those working in human rights end up being complicit in the murder of innocent victims. Nothing could be so far from the truth. This is me after the handing over of the advice, and again, Ian Knox got it right. It's not a pick and mix. If human rights are universal, then you don't get to pick them. You don't get to choose which ones you want. And in a society like ours, which has to deal with group rights, that becomes particularly contentious. So some got prioritized and others got picked over. And as a consequence, there was very little or none. Uh, consensus on what should be the way forward. This is the most recent pronouncement from the UK Commission. The long left side stage came this entirely separate process. Um, but it concluded that Northern Ireland should not have been interfered with. Um, that sounds terrible in terms of you know the issue of sex abuse. But it was almost like that. It, an interference occurred. Um, it was a complete delay mechanism. The Northern Ireland office has remained silent apart from a letter that it wrote to the parties on March 2012 last year asking them to find a way forward and needless to say I haven't found any of those letters. We're currently doing a project for Roundtree. Um, none of the parties, um, uh, with the exception I think of Sinn Féin, actually made any submissions to the UK process and that pol political vacuum continues. Um, these are the pieces that are, the Civic Forum was abandoned, particularly at a time when we have no opposition in the Northern Ireland Assembly, we should have had a Civic Forum um, and indeed I leave it to Daniel to talk about the other pieces that remain outstanding um, and you can see there what some of them are. So 15 years on are women fully present, well we still have no women in the High Court, there were very few put on the policing board, very few in any of the others. I call this Where's Wally? Um, it's the democratic deficit of the Northern Ireland Assembly. And so we need to keep an eye on the empty chair. Special measures are needed and they always are in post-conflict societies. And so why weren't they implemented in Northern Ireland? Um, the social justice issues got delayed. 
um, and the oversight is essential for there to be no regression. This is what I learned, that if you are going to be part of the negotiation process, you should keep an eye on the implementation. We recommended, the coalition recommended, an implementation committee um, to validate and for all the parties to be on it, irrespective of whether they were elected or not. Sinn Féin asked us to stand down that proposal because they were at that stage getting on, they said very well with the main parties. Um, and to our regret, we actually said, well, we'll pull it for the minute, but we do believe that an implementation committee involving all of those uh, who were party to the agreement should have been in place. And so good trade unionists will know that when you enter um, negotiations, you ask these questions. Um, are there going to be resources? Is there a timetable? What's the benchmark? What are the targets for getting this done? So those were the lessons. And um, what has, was agreed should be enforced, and that's its entirety. I love this particular one which says Spain should learn from our mistakes. I think we should learn from our mistakes. Um, and um, I, this was the day we handed over. Dermot was also there, um, and probably my question then was, is it over to you, Minister? But recently Martin McGuinness, just last week, said this, that the only people who can destroy the peace process are we, the politicians. So perhaps it's back to CEJ again, in terms of having to uh, keep the pressure up, um, and then to say to little Anya here, who was there the day we launched it, who was less than a year old, this is Colin's little daughter, uh, what would she expect in 15 years' time? Thanks very much.